Yo, and we're up. Hopefully, um, everything's running smooth for you guys. I'm going to make sure that the volume is turned up a little bit here. Let me just adjust that. Good deal. And uh, really what this is, is this is just an opportunity to be able to kind of talk to you guys a little bit about Chapter 14 and Chapter 15. Chapter 15 was on spinal cord and chapter 15 was dealing with the autonomic nervous system and there were a few things that I actually wanted to share with you guys and talk about so I'm not going to waste any more time I'm going to go right into uh, all of this and I'm going to share my screen with you and open up this PowerPoint and the first thing that I want to get back to is I want to get back to the spinal cord and show you some things. Um, one of the things I want to remind you about with the spinal cord is that the spinal cord is very simple. It's not, it's not a very complex organ at all when you look at the, the general basics of it all. The spinal cord in a nutshell is nothing more than an information elevator and it creates a relay point that allows you to create what we call reflexes. And reflexes are, are not very uh, complex systems. Uh, as a matter of fact, a reflex is something that allows us to make quick, immediate motor responses without a whole lot of deep conscious thought being involved. Because if your brain was really involved in most of the reflexes that a spinal cord takes care of, then those reflexes would take several seconds to actually um, process so that they would occur versus even getting around to them occurring. So we can see here, this is how the spinal cord actually works. You have to pay close attention to the different colored lines. Each one of these colored lines are representing the uh, neural flow of a particular neuron. None of these colors are the same kind of neuron. Uh, actually, you have somatic sensory neurons, visceral sensory neurons, autonomic motor neurons, and somatic motor neurons. Now, we see the uh, light blue and the dark blue lines. They are actually moving from the PNS of the body, the peripheral nervous system. They're moving from the outer portions of the body, coming into a spinal nerve and then passing and splitting off into the dorsal root of that spinal nerve. Remember that a spinal nerve is what we call a mixed nerve because it's made of both sensory and motor nerve fibers. So um, it's got both sensory fibers, incoming information, and motor fibers, outgoing information, traveling through the same nerve. It's kind of like looking at Interstate 85. You've got Interstate 85 North, and Interstate 85 South, both of them make up Interstate 85. But you can't just say it's just North or just South. It's both. It's mixed, just like this spinal nerve is mixed. So we see the two blue lines. Both of them are sensory neurons, but one is somatic, which means that it's bringing in incoming sensory information from the external environment as well as the limbs. And we see visceral sensory neurons, which means that this incoming sensory information from your internal organs and internal environment. Both of that sensory information, both of those pathways travel and they split off into the dorsal root, which then enters into the spinal cord. And remember, we process information amongst cell bodies, which are located in gray matter. Uh, the white matter contains tracts, uh, which are made up of the axons, whereas gray matter is made up of cell bodies and these groups of cell bodies are known as nuclei so here we see this uh, particular horn in this particular area is made up of nuclei uh, that are sens somatic sensory nuclei so they're processing the incoming information from the somatic sensory neurons and then we see the visceral sensory nuclei which are here which are processing incoming sensory information from the visceral sensory neurons and then they wind up synapsing on these interneurons which are here and they don't always have to synapse on an interneuron in a monosynaptic reflex there is no interneuron here instead 
the sensory neurons synapse directly onto the motor neurons which are located here and then we see those motor nuclei turn around and process that information and put out a motor command which is going to travel to an effector but of course before it gets to the effector it has to travel through motor neurons and so if the command is to be sent to uh, skeletal muscle um, then it's going to be sent through somatic motor neurons. If it's going to be sent to internal organs and visceral effectors, then the motor command will travel through these yellow fibers known as autonomic motor neurons. And there you can see the nuclei for those motor neurons located in these two specific colored areas. So this is what we're seeing. That's it. I mean, that, that's, that's all there is to the spinal cord. It's not uber deep. Um, you might say, well then, how do I come to awareness? How do I suddenly then know what it is that just stung me, or what I just put my hand on, and what actually just took place? Well, what you can't see in this image is that there are separate fibers that are sent um, away from the interneurons, and they pass up through tracks the information passes up through tracks through ascending tracks in the spinal cord in the white matter and it travels up through those ascending tracks through the white matter of the spinal cord until they reach um, your brain. Remember we talked about dermatomes. Uh, dermatomes were specific areas on the skin that happen to be um, supplied by single spinal nerve. So in other words when you look at the image that we had in our textbook, you'll see, like for example, this area right here near the uh, near the clavicle, this clavicular region, um, and this area here near your deltoid. This is all innervated by your C5 spinal nerves. So the spinal nerves literally have sensory neurons who run all the way out here with receptors, and they literally innervate this entire area that's labeled C5. So if I take a metal forcep and I poke this area right here, then my sensory neurons should receive signals and run all those signals all the way back to my spinal nerve, my C5 spinal nerve, go into my spinal cord, and then that information ultimately make it to my brain, and then my brain should say, hey, we have awareness that we're being poked by this metal forcep right here um, in this area that's being innervated and monitored by my C5 spinal nerves. If not, then we've got a problem. Um, that kind of lets us know that there, there's an issue there with the receptivity and the traveling of neural impulses through um, my C5 spinal nerve. It could be a block. It could very well be um, some type of trauma, some type of damage. It could be uh, a buildup of scar tissue or bone tissue around the spinal nerve in that opening, in that foramen, where the spinal nerve passes through to um, split off and then enter into the spinal cord itself. It could be a lot of different things that could be a problem, but it would ultimately let us know that there was an actual problem. Uh, something that we didn't get a chance to talk about was shingles. Shingles is a reactivation of the chickenpox infection. In other words, the virus, the uh, herpes zoster virus that gave that individual the chickenpox, that virus was able to hide in that person's body. Instead of it being purged from the person's body, that virus was able to remain in that person's body. And you got to understand something about a virus. A virus is not going to. Okay. Um, if you remember an old cartoon movie called Osmosis Jones, that was a bad um, portrayal of a virus because that virus in the movie Osmosis Jones was able to fight. That virus was deadly, just like a real virus could be, but that virus was able to, you know, to, to I think he was, had acid hands and things like that. I mean, he was, he was doing some nasty stuff. This dude was like a Disney villain. Viruses aren't like that. If a virus ran into your normal natural defenses, if he ran into your uh, your specific uh, defenses that you have, 
there'd be nothing that that virus would be able to do. You know, your white blood cells would engulf that virus and be done with them in a heartbeat. A virus could not fight back like that. They made that virus look like something out of an alien's movie. But um, a real virus can't do that. But what a virus can do is a virus can become dormant. And when a virus becomes dormant, he likes to hang out and sleep inside of your cells. The problem with a virus when it becomes dormant and it sleeps inside of your body cells is that if a virus is dormant and he's latent and he's doing nothing, your body really won't care about it. It'll say, oh, well, it's not doing anything, so I guess it's not a problem. And it, oftentimes it'll just let it sit there. So if this virus can make his way from wherever he was when he gave you the chicken pox, if he can make his way to the posterior root ganglia, then uh, due to stress and age, um, maybe some type of sickness or some type of trauma, that virus will reactivate. Then he'll get inside and travel along the axons um, in a sensory neuron, and then he can cause rashes and blisters along the dermatome that is um, directly connected to the spinal nerve that the virus infected in the first place. And it causes burning and tingling pain, which is uh, some pretty rough stuff. Not, nothing pretty about it whatsoever. Uh, we talked about this as well. We talked about the fact that there's sensory pathways and motor pathways, and I told you that I didn't like this picture because this picture um, kind of mixes two things at the same time. This picture is showing you the pathway of information, which is true. The problem is that they're showing her have a withdrawal reflex, which in a withdrawal reflex, um, that information wraps around in your spinal cord and then the information is sent to your brain. When she touched that hot pot, which I have no clue why she would have touched, a giant skillet with boiling hot lava looking gravy in it. And that's one of those skillets that's probably ceramic. So yeah, that thing's carrying some heat. Anyway, that's another talk for another day. But she touches that thing. The minute she touches it, signals are sent to her spinal cord and with a temperature, uh, incoming temperature information like that, that signal would have prompted her spinal cord to send an immediate motor command to the effectors, which you can see the effectors uh, uh, um, affected in here, which is this, her skeletal muscle. It would have told her effectors to have a, have a command, uh, not have a command, but, but have a response. Her skeletal muscle would have contracted. And then, while her skeletal muscle was being contracted, those signals would have been going on up to the brain for her brain to figure out. Now, for those of you who remember anything from the brain chapter, you'll recognize that this information is traveling through a primary sensory neuron to a secondary, to a tertiary. And if you notice here, I want to play with you just for a minute. Notice that the primary sensory neuron is coming from outside the PNS, and then it ultimately uh, synapses here in the spinal cord on a secondary sensory neuron, and then that secondary sensory neuron carries the information into the brain where it synapses, lo and behold, in the thalamus. And remember, the thalamus is the relay station for sensory information. Most of your incoming sensory information comes to the thalamus first so that the thalamus can then sort it out, sort all the information out, and figure out where in your brain that sensory information needs to go. Because you got to think about it this way. If you're sitting in a room with about 40 people at a Christmas party and everyone's talking at once, all that talking at once is going to start becoming annoying if you can't separate voices and you can't separate the conversation you're having with that person on the couch from the other 38 people talking in the house. So that's what your thalamus allows you to do. Well, it sorts out that incoming sensory information there at the thalamus and synapses on a tertiary sensory neuron who then takes that sensory information to, you guessed it, the post uh, your your 
postcentral gyrus, and then uh, on the cortex on the postcentral gyrus, and then the cortex of the precentral gyrus comes up with a motor command and sends it through an upper motor neuron, which carries it from the brain all the way to the spinal cord and synapses onto a lower motor neuron who will ultimately carry the motor command outside of the CNS into the PNS into the actual effector. Um, I want to jump from chapter 14 to chapter 15 and talk about another basic here. Remember that the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system are two total different things. The somatic nervous system is that system that is actually used uh, for your central nervous system to be able to talk to your skeletal muscle. Whereas your autonomic nervous system is that system that your um, central nervous system is going to use to talk to all of your visceral organs. Because the somatic nervous system is what you use for conscious control. The autonomic nervous system is what you use for subconscious and unconscious control. You are not using the autonomic nervous system consciously. You are not telling your spleen, "Oh, spleen, I need you and your, I need you and the stomach and the liver to, to to help me out here. I want to play a game of charades." No, it doesn't happen that way. Autonomic nervous system does things without your conscious thought. It's working when you're asleep, when you're taking a nap, when you're eating, when you're sitting in class, and when you're even listening to this with me. Now, the autonomic nervous system is divided into two different divisions. This is where it gets kind of complex, and I know that it loses some people. Uh, the autonomic nervous system has two subsets. The somatic nervous system does not. All right? So the somatic nervous system does not have subsets. The autonomic nervous system does have subsets. The autonomic nervous system subsets are known as the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division where the parasympathetic division is nicknamed the rest and digest division. Uh, they deal with energy conservation and replenishing. Um, it helps to maintain homeostasis when you're at rest. So right now, uh, I'm kind of sitting here with my laptop in my lap, and I'm sitting in my office at home kind of talking to you guys. And, um, you know, I'm not really doing much. As a matter of fact, when I get up from here, I'm going to do a few chores around the house, um, work on some things for class, and I might blog a little, and then I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to eat something, and I'm going to chill, probably watch a movie, enjoy my afternoon, all right? Well, while I'm sitting there watching this movie, what's going to wind up happening is uh, my parasympathetic division is going to kick in. It's going to take care of that food. As a matter of fact, my parasympathetic division is going to activate my digestive system and allow that to work. It's also going to activate my urinary system so it can process and filter my blood in my body and remove any uh, impurities and create urine. Now the sympathetic division is the exact opposite of a parasympathetic division. It's going to prepare my body for an emergency. It's known as the fight or flight division. It increases alertness and metabolic activity and you can remember the, the sympathetic division by the three E's. It deals with emergencies, exercise, or excitement. Now, right now, I'm doing neither of the three, but let's say a 30-foot tall mutant gopher comes out of the ground, pops right up in front of the house, and starts tearing up the neighborhood, all right? At that moment, I'm going to jump into one of those three E's. I can guarantee you that emergency is going to be one of the first things that's going to pop up. Uh, I'm going to be finding a way out of here because there's a giant mutant gopher tearing up the neighborhood. I've got to go. So that's going to take me into a state of fight or flight. It's going to be an emergency. Sometimes uh, sympathetic division doesn't require an emergency to kick in. Your sympathetic division can kick in just because you're exercising. If, uh, let's say, I go out and I'm playing paintball with some friends, um, that, can, that can be uh, a type of exercise. When I go to run in the morning, that can be a type of exercise. If I go to lift weights with some friends, that can be a type of exercise. And my sympathetic division gets my body pumped and jacked for that. I've mentioned to some of you guys in class how there's no greater feeling than just before a game. When you're at that game and you're waiting in the tunnel 
and you can hear them cut the lights off in the in the um in the gym. Uh, you hear you hear the uh, the lights go off in the arena, and then you start hearing the band or the DJ start playing that intro song, and everyone goes nuts because you're about to come out on that court and do your thing. Your heart is beating so hard that you just want to open your chest and just let it run down the hall because your sympathetic division is is just ramped up at that moment with the exercise and excitement. There's so much excitement taking place in that hallway at that moment in time. Um, when you ride roller coasters and when you go to the theme park, that excitement gets your sympathetic division up and running. M many people like that feeling. Um, that's why people like horror movies. I'm not a big horror movie fan. I used to watch horror movies all the time. Ridiculous. But the reason why I used to love horror movies so much was that excitement never knowing what was going to happen next. You saw 10 people go in, you know that you know only one person's coming out because you've seen the preview. There's only one person on the poster and the movie just started with 10 people. So you know only you know nine of them are going to die. You're just freaking out over how the nine people are going to actually die. So that's the excitement that you feel. Now, when you start talking about the parasympathetic division, you talk about how it's responsible for uh, you know, maintaining homeostasis at rest, it conserves energy and replenishes nutrient storage. Um, that's something that we're going to have to get into in 211 quite a bit. But when you line up the two uh, divisions and you start talking about their anatomical differences, you begin to see something very key. For example, you notice that the preganglionic neurons are in the brain stem or in the S2 through S4 of the spinal cord for parasympathetic. In other words, I can find parasympathetic preganglionic neurons extending from the brainstem, and I can find them extending all the way from your S2 to S4 spinal nerves off of your spinal cord. Wait a minute. In other words, that's telling me that I can find preganglionic neurons at the brainstem at the very beginning of where your spinal cord is going to start and I can find them at the very end of the spinal cord but I don't find any in between. Now isn't that interesting? So so if, if I was looking at the brain and the spinal cord I would only find preganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic division sticking out the very beginning and the very end. None throughout the middle. The sympathetic preganglionic neurons they're in the lateral horns of your T1 all the way through your L2. So they go all the way from your thor the thoracic uh, spinal nerves all the way down to your lumbar spinal nerves. Um, another thing you'll notice is that the preganglionic axons are much longer in the parasympathetic and the postganglionic axons are a lot shorter. And then they're the opposite with the sympathetic. The ganglia in a parasympathetic division are actually close to or within the effector. Wow. Whereas the ganglia in the sympathetic are relatively close to the spinal cord. If you remember the models that we looked at in lab, the ganglia, the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic trunk, sympathetic chain ganglia, the sympathetic trunk, you notice that that thing was running parallel with the spinal cord, extremely close to the spinal cord. Whereas the ganglia for your parasympathetic, no, they, they were nowhere to be found because they're really close to or actually inside of the effector that they're talking to. And here's an image that kind of shows you what I was trying to talk about before. You can see the parasympathetic uh, neurons. Look at how they branch off the, the uh, brain stem. And then you don't see any parasympathetic neurons until you get all the way down here. So they're way up here. And way down there. But the sympathetic division are all these little purple guys. All the way down. They're in between. And here's a physical image showing the parasympathetic division. There's that short postganglionic axon and that really long preganglionic axon. So this uh, preganglionic axon, his cell body is somewhere inside the CNS. His axon travels outside of the CNS and then to um, a ganglion 
which could be actually attached to the effector itself. And there's a short postganglionic axon, which it, this guy is going to be short because it's already at the effector. It doesn't have much further to go. It's already there. Whereas over here, in the sympathetic division, here's the preganglionic neuron. His cell body is in the CNS. And his ganglion is right there. So his axon doesn't need to be but so long because the ganglia, the sympathetic chain ganglia, are located right there beside the spinal cord. And you can see where you have preganglionic axons that are branching off and going in other directions. Then you have to have a really long postganglionic axon because that thing needs to actually reach its effector. Let's uh Let's talk about the degree of response. You know, parasympathetic activation has a local response uh, because of the long preganglionic neurons with the limited branches. But uh, when you look at sympathetic activation, it usually activates multiple structures. Let's go back at that for a minute. Look at that. Parasympathetic activation has a local response. Very specific. If it's going to activate your stomach, it activates your stomach. That's about it. Sympathetic? Oh no. Sympathetic wants to kick off a whole bunch of people. Now, why is it that parasympathetic is only targeting very specific places and sympathetic is targeting like a whole group? Well, that's because of the response. Parasympathetic is usually rest and digest, which is very processed. It's very, it's very detailed. Um, you know, digestion is a process that can last for 16 hours if you're talking about eating a meal. If I go downstairs right now and I eat dinner, um, it, from the time I eat to the time that stuff has finished digestion and has become fecal matter uh, and is ready to be expelled from my body as excrement, um, that can take up to 16 hours for that meal to actually go through that process. Very detailed process, takes its time. Rest and digest. Rest and repose. That's parasympathetic. That ain't sympathetic. Sympathetic is dealing with excitement, emergencies, exercise. It's immediate. It's things that need to happen right now. And so it gets as many organs and tissues and cells involved in this right now immediate thing as it possibly can. That's why some of the things that are listed there at the bottom that actually occur when response to stress, whether the good stress or bad stress, happens to be increased heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, pupil dilation, all types of things like that. Basically, you're stimulating everything from your cardiovascular system to your respiratory system all at once. And so there's simultaneous activations of a multitude of different effectors at the same time. One last thing, I'll let you guys go. I want to show you an example of what's known as autonomic tone. In autonomic tone here, an example that's given is the diameter of most blood vessels in a partially constricted state due to sympathetic tone. There's a decrease in stimulation below tone, causes vessel dilation. An increase above sympathetic tone causes greater vessel constriction. Um, what I want to mention here is you're going to see this a lot in anatomy and physiology part two. And what this is talking about is so this is talking about the fact that there are organs in your body who are just kind of just sitting there just chilling. And the fact that most of the time, most of the time, I said most, not every time, most. Most of the time, the way your body works is one division is on and the other division is off. However, there are times where both divisions are on at the same time. Now, those are very few, so that's why I can say that most of the time, one division is on and one division is off. It is crucial that if you are taking an anatomy and physiology course, that you understand this about sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Because you're going to play with this concept a ton when you're talking about visceral organ systems. Let's use uh, the cardiovascular system and the example that's being utilized here. And we're going to end our talk right here with this slide. Talking about blood vessels. You know, usually, um, 
if your blood vessels are uh, usually your blood vessels are you know in a partially constricted state. Um, if my sympathetic division um, is stimulated, all right. Um, actually, I want to give you a slide to kind of explain this. I think I have the slide somewhere. Yeah, here we go. Um, sometimes your system will create. No, that's not what I want. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to find one particular thing. What I wanted to find was. I guess I'll have to use. I guess I have to use this example. Yeah, I have to use this example here. Okay, where it says control of heart rate, notice that it says parasympathetic stimulation slowing the heart rate. Sympathetic stimulation increases heart rate. Same cells with both uh, muscularinic and adrenergic receptors. Now, what I want to point out there is that you have two different divisions, parasympathetic and sympathetic. They're both targeting the same cells in your heart. But it depends on what you need at that moment in time. You need to understand that both of these divisions are not activating in your heart at the exact same time. Most of the time in the body, you're going to see these systems, these divisions, activate separate from one another. One will activate, the other one won't. Then the other one will, and then the other one won't. So it's almost like, okay, if I want to use my sympathetic, I need to cut my parasympathetic off. And if I want to use my parasympathetic, I need to cut my sympathetic off. In this case, where it says control of heart rate, this is an example of such a situation. Right now, I am sitting still. I'm sitting still, sitting with my laptop, chilling in the room. My parasympathetic system is kicked in and my heart rate is fine. But if I jump up from here and I go to the side, I'm just going to run for three miles and then come back to clear my mind. When I go to run for three miles, my heart rate is not going to slow down. My heart rate is going to pick up. So my parasympathetic stimulation is going to shut off and my sympathetic stimulation is going to cut on and it's going to increase my heart rate. They go back and forth all of the time. Same thing with the example down there about the muscular activity in my GI tract. In, in other words, my gastrointestinal tract, my digestive tract. That tract is controlled by smooth muscle. And so parasympathetic division, when it's stimulated, it accelerates the rate of contraction and motility. In other words, it stimulates my digestive tract to become more active. When my sympathetic division kicks in, it decreases motility. Now, why would sympathetic division decrease motility? Because I need to convert, I need to conserve all of my energy and my time and my blood flow to what I'm doing at that moment. Because my sympathetic division is all about excitement, energy, fight or flight. All right. If I'm running for my life, I don't need to, you know, I'm going to divert blood flow from my digestive tract to my skeletal muscles so that I can run faster. I'm going to divert blood flow to my cardiovascular system so it can pump this blood flow to the other parts of my body. And I'm going to divert more blood flow so that my cardiovascular system can send that blood to my respiratory system so I can get more oxygen, so I can have more endurance, so I can run faster from the 30-foot tall mutant gopher. I am not going to be trying to digest food, but when I've escaped the 30-foot mutant gopher, it's dead. The day is saved, the movie is over, the credits have rolled, and there's no secret ending at the end, and I'm one of the few people who live, then I can start thinking about being hungry. Blood can be re-diverted back to my digestive tract, and when I eat, then what will happen is my digestive tract will break down that food, my blood will absorb that energy, and then I can utilize that energy in my entire body. And that is our short and brief explanation on... Uh, some tidbits about the spinal cord and some tidbits about um, some tidbits about spinal cord and some tidbits about 
the um, autonomic nervous system. So I hope that helps. I hope that's good for you, and I'll see you in class soon.